Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to give this lecture. I appreciate I'm in a department of electrical and electronic engineering. I did my PhD in radio astronomy, but I'm not going to talk an awful lot about radio astronomy, but it will get passing mention. I'm going to talk more about the objects, the pulsars, that I accidentally discovered using a radio telescope. I want you to start by imagining you have about 2,000 satellite TV dishes. You have them joined up with low-loss cable. You have an excellent, excellent receiver. And you point this array of satellite dishes at a specially chosen part of the sky. And you hear... It sounds a bit like a truck, tractor, in need of maintenance, maybe a helicopter, wouldn't trust a helicopter if it sounded like that. You're listening actually to a star, mass 10 to the 27 tons, a thousand million, 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 million tons, all spinning 11 times a second. 11 times a second is 660 revs per minute. The internal combustion engine idles about 700, and that's why it sounds a bit like a truck. It's roughly running because in the space between the source of the radio waves and your array of satellite dishes, the amplitude of the wave suffers some effects. And some waves come in strong, some pulses come in strong, and some come in weak, and hence the in need of maintenance sound. There are times when I wished it was just a truck or a tractor, but alas, it's not. It's what we call a pulsating radio star, pulsar for short, and also called a neutron star because they're objects that are very rich in neutrons. I may use pulsar or neutron star interchangeably, and apologies if I slip, I will try and talk about pulsars, abbreviation for pulsating radio star. I want first to spend a minute or two talking you through the life history of a star so that you understand where these stars come in the sequence, in the pattern of things. And I'm going to drop the light levels a little bit for this part of the talk. That's probably too much. No, it's not too much. This is uh, the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation of Orion. So called because of this shape in a horse's head. It's actually dark foreground material silhouetted against hydrogen. This is hydrogen glowing in its red spectral line. And whenever in an astronomical photograph you see a red splodge, you can very safely say, ah, hydrogen. Because hydrogen makes up 75% by mass of the universe. It's in the dark clouds that I want to focus because that's where the action is, where new stars form. Note that there's relatively few stars down here compared with up here. That's because the dark cloud cuts out the light from stars beyond it, and you only see relatively few stars this side of the cloud. The cloud, which is known as a dense, dark, molecular cloud, or any permutation of those adjectives, is dark indeed, is dense compared with a lot of space, it's not dense in absolute terms. And it's molecular in the sense that there are simple molecules in these clouds. There's another whole lecture talking about the chemistry of these clouds 
and the molecules that you see. Water, ammonia, formaldehyde, carbon, my, carbon monoxide, small um, ring molecules, all sorts of fascinating things. It's in these dark clouds that new stars form. The temperature's fairly low, about 10 degrees Kelvin. The particles are milling around slowly. But maybe a shock wave comes through, or maybe by chance a knot forms with slightly enhanced density. And this slightly enhanced density pulls in a few more particles, which increases the concentration of the knot, puts up the gravity, pulls in a few more particles, which increases the mass of the knot, increases the gravity, and so on. And over a period of some millions of years, what started as a pretty small knot will grow. After a few million years, the temperature in the center has risen a lot, just due to the pressure of the overlying material. And when the temperature in the center reaches about 10 million degrees, nuclear reactions start. The conversion of hydrogen to helium and the release of energy. That energy comes out as starlight. The star is now shining. It has switched on. And most of the stars you see in the sky are doing that nuclear fusion of hydrogen to helium today. The sun's doing it at quite a surprising rate. The sun uses 600 million tons of hydrogen every second. It's done it for 5 billion years, and it'll do it for about another 5 billion years. Sorry, wrong way. Quite near Orion is a group of stars called the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. This is a group of young stars by astronomical standards, less than 100 million years old. They're the astrophysical equivalent of the young man in the sports car. They're bright, they're flashy, there's no money in the bank and it won't last long. <laughs> and they'll die young. These are stars that are maybe 20, 30 times the mass of the sun. Because they're bigger, the interior temperature's higher, the nuclear reactions go faster, there's more light, and it goes through, the star goes through its hydrogen quicker. And so it dies young. Big stars like this are the precursors of pulsars. So they're important for our story. This is a group of stars in the southern hemisphere, so you can't see it in our night sky. It was called the Jewel Box by Sir John Herschel when he worked at the Cape in South Africa. And he called it the Jewel Box because some of the stars in this group have distinct colors, like this one, which is an orangey-red color. That's a star that's past its prime. It's showing signs of senility. It's a star that has exhausted the hydrogen in its core, and it's moving through one or two other stages before it finally dies. It's in its core actually converting helium to make carbon. It's what our sun will start doing in about five billion years when it runs out of hydrogen. It will swell perhaps a hundredfold, dangerous for the Earth. Its surface will cool, and instead of being white hot, it'll be red hot. That's what we know as a red giant. And to continue the colorful language, it's followed by what we call a white dwarf. I want you to focus on that star and this ring of material. This star happens to be in the same direction, but has nothing to do with the story. This is what we call a white dwarf. It's the inner part of one of those big red-orangey stars, red giants. This ring of material, see the red color? What's it made of? Hydrogen. Good, quick learners at Imperial. <laughs> it's actually a three-dimensional shell, but it's very, very thin. And you only see it round the edges where you're looking through a greater thickness. The best analogy is a child's balloon. Blow the balloon up large, close to bursting, and look at it and try and see what color it is. 
If you look straight on towards the center of the balloon, it's just a whitish color. You see the color best round the edge, where you're looking through a greater thickness. Here, too, you see a greater thickness of material, and so you see it. This shell of material used to be the outer layers of this star, and it kicked off its outer layers, and they're in the process of floating out into space and thinning and becoming invisible. This star, the remains of the red giant, is now small. It's got no nuclear reactions going. It's not producing energy. It's still hot, so it's glowing, white hot, by its temperature, but it's cooling. It's cooling slowly because it's a small body. And if you remember your physics, the luminosity of a spherical body depends on the surface area. This thing has quite a small surface area, so it cools slowly. But it will cool from white to yellow to orange to red to brown to invisible. And that's the way the majority of stars will end. And it doesn't give us pulsars. It doesn't give us several other things, but it doesn't give us pulsars in particular. Another photograph from the Southern Hemisphere, part of a nearby galaxy called the Magellanic Cloud, named after Magellan, the explorer, but in turning it into an adjective, you'd be hard pushed to recognize it, Magellanic Cloud. This is the larger of the two, and it's part of it. There's lots of pink stuff, hydrogen, glowing mass up here of stars and gas, many, many stars dotted all over the place, and one picked out with an arrow. Since I think there's relatively few astronomers here, I will just mention the arrow was added afterwards. <laughs> Astronomy is not that easy. But watch that corner of the photograph. This is the star we had to pick out with an arrow. It has exploded catastrophically. It's what we call a supernova or a supernova. A nova in this instance means new star. Every so often stars brighten up and become visible, so they're novas. But ones that do it in a big way are supernova. And this represents the star doing a kamikaze, if you like. It has exploded, and we used to think everything had got wiped out in the explosion. We now know that in the explosion, the core remains. Indeed, the core gets kicked against and compressed. And that becomes a neutron star or a pulsar. So that's probably the way the, the pulsars form. There are some alternative theories around now, but this core collapse is one of the main theories. So there's a, a huge lot of material getting kicked out into space. It's material that's very important for us because in that material being kicked out into space, there's useful carbon, oxygen, iron, lithium, potassium, sodium, neon, you name it. All the elements, certainly up to iron and probably beyond, are in that material that's being thrown out into space. And the atoms of carbon, oxygen, calcium, iron, etc., in your bodies came from one of these exploding stars and nowhere else. You are the product of a star that died explosively. Or you're a bit of nuclear waste, if you prefer <laughs> that. This is the remains of a star that exploded a thousand years ago. I think the left-hand screen is slightly better. There's a faint blue tatty mess. There's a pair of stars here, and the bottom right one is the core of the star that exploded and produced this tatty mess. And this mess is still being kept glowing because there's still energy coming from this star. It's a pulsar. 
and the pulsar energy keeps the nebula glowing so we can see it. So that's one that exploded about a thousand years ago. This is one that exploded about 10,000 years ago. And indeed, you heard the pulsar associated with this explosion on the tape at the beginning. The source of the explosion, if I'm working from this screen, source of explosion is somewhere away out there, like another 10 foot out there. This is the front of the material that's come from the explosion. So over the 10,000 years, it has traveled yay far and got to there. And this is the material that's enriched in carbon and oxygen and so on. Also in the photograph, lots of hydrogen, lots and lots of stars. And you may also be able to see a trail across the photograph like that. In order to take this photograph, the camera shutter was open 20 minutes or so. And during that 20 minutes, something flew across the patch of sky being photographed and was captured. It's not bright enough to be an aeroplane. It's probably not a satellite either. It might be a meteor, but it's probably a piece of X satellite, space junk, because satellites break up and then the pieces re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and glow. And there is a lot of space junk up there, even more at the moment because in the recent past both the US and China have zapped some satellites just to show that they can zap some satellites and split them into a million pieces, which means there is a lot of that stuff. And it's hazardous for satellites, but it's particularly hazardous for astronauts. So now to talk a little bit about the properties of these stars. I've already mentioned that they weigh 10 to the power 27 tons. That's comparable with the sun. They have a radius of 10 kilometers. And I don't mean 10 to the power something kilometers, I mean 10 kilometers. So if you put that mass inside a ball of radius 10 kilometers, you have a very dense ball. Densities comparable, average densities comparable to the density of the nucleus of the atom. I don't find that very easy to visualize, so Maybe this is better. Take a thimble, a sewing thimble, preferably a nice silver one. Take the population of the globe, six, six billion odd people, and take those six billion people one by one and jam them into the thimble. Teenagers love this. When you've got all six billion people jammed into the thimble, it weighs much the same as it would if it were made of material of one of these pulsars or neutron stars. It is extremely dense. And there is some fantastic physics that arises because of this sheer density. When you've got that much material in a very small ball, the surface gravity is strong. And the work you would do climbing a micron, a thousandth of a meter, on one of these neutron stars is comparable to the work you do climbing Everest here on Earth. And uh, the atmosphere, any atmosphere, is collapsed. This is actually in the absence of electromagnetic forces, but that doesn't make much difference. And the atmosphere is only one or two centimeters thick. So if I were standing on a neutron star, if, the atmosphere would be around my toes, and in order to breathe, I'd need to get my nostrils down there. And I'd probably have to breathe hydrogen as well. <laughs> the strong gravity also bends light. And you can see over the horizon on one of these stars. Something like 20 degrees over the horizon. So again, if I'm standing on a neutron star, a pulsar, and I look around me, <laughs> I can see something like two-thirds of the surface without moving. 
so much is space bent and, and the light paths bent by the very strong gravity. Uh, Professor Spence mentioned little green men. If there were little green men on one of these stars, the strong gravity would redshift the light and they would look like little red men to us. <laughs> and gravity also affects clocks. I mean, you probably already know this from GPS. You know, this, this is relativity theory, and in order for your GPS to work properly, it has to know about general relativity. It's even more extreme on one of these stars. A clock that should tick once every second ticks about once every two seconds. If I took one of these clocks to one of the stars and used it to measure my pulse, I wouldn't actually notice anything different because the gravitational effect would, the gravity would affect my metabolism in the same way as it affects the clock. So I can take my pulse with a clock anywhere as long as the clock and I are together and the pulse is still okay. However, there are problems with tidal effects. Suppose I'm coming into land on one of these pulsars or neutron stars. And I'm coming into land feet first because that's the ladylike way to land on one of these. As I come into land, I'm pulled down by the very strong gravity. But the gravity on my feet is much stronger than the gravity on my head. And so my body gets stretched. The technical term is spaghettification. <laughs> but actually the difference in gravity between my feet and my head is so strong that the spaghetti snaps. Your body is pulled apart. And even if I curl up small, make myself into a ball as small as I can, the difference in gravity between the lower part of my body and the upper part of my body. So don't go visit a neutron star. <laughs> there are apparently very strong magnetic fields, something like 10 to the 8 Tesla. To put that in contact, context, a fridge magnet, typical fridge magnet, is probably about one hundredth of a Tesla. And a lab magnet that you might be proud of is probably 10 Tesla. These are very, very strong magnetic fields. And it's in a spinning object. When you spin a strong magnetic field, you get, whoops, phenomenal voltage drops, a billion volts per centimeter. Just think what all these electrical and magnetic fields would do to the metabolism in your body. As I understand it, metabolism works because of small polarizations of molecules, for example. This kind of electrical field is going to thoroughly upset all the polarizations and all the metabolisms. And so you probably won't survive. So don't go visit a neutron star. And don't take your credit cards either. <laughs> all that this 10 to the 27 tons and the immense magnetic field appears to rotate as a solid body. We believe the pulse period, the period we hear, pick up, is the rotation period. And we get periods for the fastest ones at about one and a half milliseconds and the slowest ones about 10 seconds. For a pulsar width towards the faster end, 200 milliseconds, You've only got to go out 100 kilometers from the spin axis and you're traveling at the speed of light, which establishes uh, in another way that a pulsar has to be smaller than, 10 kil than 100 kilometers radius. We actually believe they're more like 10 or 12, but they certainly can't be more than 100, so they really are small. This is a, what we think is going on. In the middle is the pulsar, 10 kilometers radius. There's its spin axis, so geographic north, geographic south. You know that on Earth, magnetic north is not at the geographic north pole. 
it's slightly offset. Similarly, maybe even more so in a pulsar. So there's geographic north, there's magnetic north, magnetic south. The magnetic field, we've shown it like a dipole. Most things look like a dipole at a distance. What it's like up, close up, dear only knows. And over the magnetic poles, where the field lines go a long way out into space, you have this kind of trumpet or cone shape. And out of the cone comes a beam of radio waves. And this beam sweeps around the sky as the star spins. It's like a lighthouse. Some of the stars will be orientated so that the beam sweeps across the Earth as it spins. Some won't. Some will spin with the beam going around like that, and we'll never see it. But a number sweep a beam across the Earth. And those are the ones we see, or can see, we can pick up. It's like a lighthouse, but it's operating in the radio rather than with optical light. But it's like a lighthouse because, you know, each lighthouse has its own pattern of flashes. And each lighthouse has its own period of flashes. So some of them go flash, 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 flash. Some of them go flash, flash, and so on. Similarly with the pulsars. Each has its own spin rate, so the beam comes round at a certain period. And actually it turns out that each appears to have its own pattern of beam. They're not just a single pulse, some of them. Some of them are blip, blip, or blip, 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 or all sorts of patterns. So my thesis advisor has patented the idea that you could use these things as navigation beacons for interstellar travel. He's getting on, and I don't think he'll see this patent realized, but the idea is sound. The complication is you need a very big radio telescope to pick up the signals. Something like Jodrell Bank, the big dish there. And so you have a spacecraft and you bolt Jodrell Bank onto the side of it and then launch it. Or maybe you bolt the spacecraft to the dish and then launch it. The theory is absolutely right and as the radio technology improves and we can operate with smaller collecting areas, this will undoubtedly be practicable. And so you go sailing through the galaxy, and you turn your telescope and say, oh, yep, that's that pulsar, that's that one, there's that one, so we're here. And you know where you are. And it's neat, but we just don't need it quite yet. <laughs> These things are very weak emitters of radio waves. In picking up the program, you would use millions of times the energy that a radio telescope picks up from all the known pulsars in a year, just doing that. They are very, very weak. Radio astronomers work in units called Janskys, 10 to the minus 26 watts per meter squared per hertz. The signals are small, and this is why we need radio quiet environments for radio telescopes and extremely good amplifiers. So they're weak, but if you can detect them, there are all sorts of fun things you can do. And I'm going now to demonstrate something you can do. Uh, we're going to drop the microphone, so I will try and remember to speak up. If the back row can't hear me, will you wave or something? Can you hear me at the moment? Great. Um, for the front row, this demonstration is not totally... around. Yeah. Can you hear 
Speaker of War Books. Yeah. Just drop the reflection. What I should try and convince you is that as the timer is coming towards you, the posters get piled up on each other and the space between them is smaller. As it's moving away, they're more spread out. But we have a technically very competent audience and you're probably scratching your heads and wondering. You are hearing a Doppler shift Actually, it's not the Doppler shift on the pulse. It's the Doppler shift on the carrier wave. In other words, if this gave out a continuous note, you'd still hear the warble. But it's a pretty good demonstration. Now, pulsars are very accurate timekeepers. They are as good as the best terrestrial time standards although the U.S. is working on this because they don't like being beaten by nature. <laughs> and because we now have pulsars dotted throughout the galaxy, we now have reliable clocks dotted throughout the galaxy, and we can start testing Einstein's relativity. And that is beginning to be done. When about 100 pulsars were known, there are now about 2,000, but when about 100 pulsars were known, somebody said, it's about time we found one paired up with another star. And the next pulsar they found was paired up with another star. It was discovered by two folks in the US, Joe Taylor and his student Russell Hulse. And to begin with, they didn't know what the hell was going on because this pulsar appeared to keep changing its period. And they were observing it with a telescope in Puerto Rico called Arecibo, which is basically a transit instrument. It looks straight up. And they could only observe the pulsar for at most a couple of hours each day. It was quite hard to track and find out what was going on. But they fairly quickly realized that they had a pulsar in a binary system, in a pair that it was a very, very interesting binary because it was a close, fast pairing. It was about eight hours for the orbit, to, for an orbital period. And so the pulsar was moving at a considerable velocity and things were relativistic. One of the predictions of Einstein's theory of general relativity is that there should be a new kind of radiation called gravitational radiation. Einstein said that when you accelerate, you should emit this new kind of radiation, which is known as ripples in space-time. So when you accelerate away from the traffic lights, or as the Earth goes round the sun, or as a pulsar goes round its companion star, there's acceleration, so there should be these gravitational waves emitted. Gravitational waves would carry away energy. So taking the example of the pulsar going around a companion star, because it's the strongest emitter of the three I've mentioned, taking that example, as the pulsar and companion star send out gravitational waves, they lose energy. The net result is the pair of stars moves closer together. The gravitational force of attraction is stronger, the acceleration is stronger, the orbit is tighter, the stars go round faster, and there's more gravitational radiation emitted. So the stars lose more energy, so they move closer together. So there's more acceleration, they go round faster, and more gravitational radiation is emitted. And more energy is lost, so the stars move closer together. And what happens, in fact, is the two stars spiral in towards each other. And if I go back to my demonstration and show you what that's like in terms of Doppler shift, then you'll be well on the way to understanding the graph that I have up at the moment. So, first of all...
So you can actually, because of the precision of these objects, see the shrinkage of the orbit, see the orbital parameters changing. And the graph that I have up shows one of the orbital parameters for that first pulsar discovered in a pair, in a binary system. It was discovered in 1974, and they've tracked it actually right up to the present. And the black dots are the data. You see initially there were measurable error bars. The technique quickly got better. Down here the error bars are about 2% the size of the dot. The line is not the best fit. The line is Einstein's prediction. And it is a very good fit. Pulsar astronomers are continuing to tackle Einstein's theory, testing every aspect they can of general relativity. So far, it has stood up. And the parameter that they've measured best shows that Einstein's theory is accurate to 0.02%. But the pulsar astronomers aren't done yet. There's lots more they can do. And we may yet see general relativity crumble and we may need some other theories of gravity. I'm going to finish with some lighter stuff. The name Pulsar was coined by the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph. Sorry for those of you who don't like right-wing newspapers, <laughs> but they have had very good science correspondents. This was Anthony Michaelis, and at just after the time of the discovery, he visited us in Cambridge and said, what are you going to call these things? And actually, we hadn't given the matter any thought. We already had quasars, which is an abbreviation for quasi-stellar radio source. So he said, what about pulsar as an abbreviation for pulsating radio star? And he wrote it up on the board, and it looked pretty good. So pulsars they became. The name has subsequently been taken over by Nissan for a model of car, but for some geraniums, and of course the watch company. Uh, you might be interested to know that in the United States, the watch company tried suing the radio astronomers for use of the name. <laughs> And finally, I've done some work for the Guinness Book of Records, so I'm going to end with half a dozen uh, records. The pressure at the center of a neutron star, pulsar, is large. <laughs> That's 10 to the 24 times the atmospheric pressure. The fastest known pulsar is a period, well, this is... The, this is the name of the pulsar. It's right ascension, which is like longitude, and declination, which is like latitude. Period, 1.55 milliseconds. Look how precisely it's measured. And this three is not all experimental uncertainty. If you measure a pulsar to that kind of accuracy, you see that in the final decimal place, it's gradually getting larger. The pulsars are slowing, but slowly. And that pulsar sounds really rather different from the one that we heard to begin with. It's going at about 600 hertz, 700 hertz. Just recently, they found an even faster one. Uh, it's not yet measured to the same accuracy because we haven't known about it so long, but it's under 1.4 milliseconds. This is interesting because there is a theory that says the fastest a pulsar can go is around 700 hertz. If it tries to go faster, you get instabilities in the interior, in the core, Rossby instabilities, and they radiate this gravitational radiation which carries away energy and effectively serves as a break. So, of course, the hunt is on to find an even faster one and bust the theory. Watch this space. The first planets discovered beyond the solar system were planets round a pulsar. I'll start with a 
two-handed demonstration. A star, a planet. The planet goes round the star. You see, almost unconsciously, the bottle is moving a little bit, so that if I take the planet, the planet away, you can still see the star moving. This is the way they discover planets round stars. And in the case of a pulsar, it's this business again. You're looking for the little movement as the planets tug the pulsar around. And if you watch for long enough, you can deduce how many planets there are, what their periods are, what their masses are. And in this particular case, we know of three plus a tiny planet round this pulsar. It's a disturbing result. I can think of reasons why there should be no planets around pulsars. If that reason was wrong, I would expect 50, 100 pulsars with planets. We have one. Problem. Problem not solved. <laughs> Very interesting. Don't quite know what's going on here. The roundest known thing in the universe is the orbit of a pulsar around its companion star. Again, it's done with Doppler shifts. And that particular pulsar, its orbit is round to five microns in the radius of the orbit. So that's an eccentricity of under 1.3 by 10 to the minus 7. Now, there may be rounder things in the universe, but that's the roundest known. And finally, if you go to the surface of a neutron star and observe something falling, it hits the deck traveling at half the speed of light. These things are just incredible. But I guess we have to believe them. Thank you for your interest. <laughs>